Hello and welcome to the 2020 Online Athens Women's Football Summit. I hope you've enjoyed day number one. This is the final session for day one. And whenever I say this name, Sabrina Bujabasic, I get excited. Uh, for me, this is my third interview with her this year. And I just want to say, if you want to pursue a career in the football industry, you better get those notepads, you better get those pens, because you're going to get some great inspiration but also some career tips of what it takes to pursue a career by running a football club. So, Sabrina, welcome. Thank you, Ed. Uh, first of all, wow, what an introduction. I think every single time I'm going to start blushing every single time we meet. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and it's a pleasure, of course, to be part of such a movement and to be part of today's show. Uh, and I'm glad that I, I can share it with you, of course, because we've had so many times to share it together in the previous year. Absolutely. Before we even go deep th in this interview, Sabrina did an amazing chat with Elise LeHue and Shauna Simbo for our Facebook series. And you've got to check that out because it was great to see two women elevate in their game or running a club. So check that out in some of the replays. But getting in depth, uh, I know your story, but today is about promoting it and educating people if they haven't. Could you just share to the audience your football career journey to what led you to be where you are now? Well, uh, <laughs> probably should start from the beginning. Why football? Uh, well, I used to live in the States. I used to live in Vancouver, Washington, which most people really don't know where that is at. So I usually say Portland, Oregon. And I think everybody in the States as well says the same thing uh, because it's really difficult to explain. It's a small city. Uh, I used to play basketball. I used to do swimming, volleyball, track, everything. But uh, somehow one day I played soccer with the kids and my physical ed teacher told me, you know, you, you're doing a wonder jo wonderful job. You should play uh, soccer. It's okay. I never thought of it because most of our people, even in uh, the States, the Bosnians that were in the States, um, they weren't really for that for women to play soccer or football. So it was kind of a sport that nobody really wanted to go into because they were always thought of it as a men's sport, which is completely different in the States. So it was a good opportunity for me to start because it felt more of a women's sport or more uh, women were interested in this sport, which is not the case back home, of course, in Bosnia. Um, and I started there, I started playing uh, when I was 12 years old, which was quite old compared to everybody else. But uh, I started, I became the captain after a year and a half. Uh, we won two state titles, uh, went and uh, competed in high school for Vancouver, Washington, received a scholarship. Unfortunately, due to a back injury, uh, that scholarship was pulled away, <laughs> unfortunately, but it was a good um, transition for me because I was 19 years old and I decided to do something completely bold, which uh, even then I don't know where the courage came from. I decided to move back to Bosnia after living in the States for around 14, 15 years, maybe even longer. I decided to move back to uh, Bosnia where only had like aunts and uncles and I came back here to kind of, um, you know, spend a year to see how it is here. I've only been on summer vacations and what can you see? Everything's perfect during summer. You know, you have the beach, you have the mountains, everything looks perfect. So I wanted to be here with the big snow during winter and I kind of fell in love with the country itself and I said, okay, why not go to university here? I can get a degree from the uh, States as well. So I joined a university in a city called Tuzla. Um, unfortunately, they didn't have a women's team, uh, only Sarajevo did at the moment. And when I joined the, the University for International Law, was my bachelor's degree, uh, I noticed there's a lot of girls, little girls playing with boys, you know, football uh, on the streets. And it's typical here to see people playing on the streets. So I said, okay, I, I want to start a football school. I want to start a school for little children just so they can have a place all the girls can meet together. So it's not so, let's say, taboo for parents to accept something like this. For them, it's, uh, you know, I'm going to let my child, you know, go play, play on the street with boys. No. Sometimes it's much easier when you see so many other girls there. So we started, uh, it took me two months to get 10 girls. The reason why is because most parents were actually not even into the idea of girls playing uh, football. A lot of them called me, even cussed at me and said, you know, uh, my girl's gonna look like a tomboy. She's gonna play a men's sport. You know, it's not attractive. She should play tennis. And I was shocked. I get 10 girls and then three of them, you know, fall uh, because their parents would not allow it. 
I grew up a little bit differently. My parents allowed for me to, you know, train in any type of sport I wanted. So kind of going through the situation taught me a lot. Uh, but I was lucky after two months, we were able to actually, instead of 10 girls, we started with 10 girls, but after two and a half months, we opened up the football league school and we had 30 girls apply. And out of those 30 girls, we had 15 girls that had previous experience playing. So because of the limited amount of uh, teams in the country, we were able to join the Premier League. So we already had a full Premier League team, even though they were young. I was not expecting this. So we registered the team, I formed the team, uh, I coached it, I was the vice president, and I played at certain periods of time. And then after a few years, I decided to, I, I missed playing full-time without considering any other obstacles that I had. I left the team in good hands, of course, and I came to Sarajevo to play uh, full-time for the best women's team that had been champions for the last 17 years, that play in Champions League. Um, and it, it was a good experience for me to move t uh, to play with them. So I moved to Sarajevo, started playing with them uh, in the national team. And then I finished my bachelor's degree and I was like, what, am I going to be a lawyer? <laughs> Sounds boring to me. There's no sports involved. Uh, so I did some research and I joined uh, ISDE, which is uh, Institute for Sports Law uh, and many other majors, of course. But I finished my uh, international master's degree for sports law at ISDE in Madrid. I believe it was 2014 because time passes, you know, so fast. I can't remember exactly. But uh, I finished my degree and I was very happy. The first class I had, I had a lawyer from Bayern Munich and I was like, you know, he's explaining how he's taking Lewandowski, this guy, that guy. And I was like, am I really sitting here? This is what I'm learning. So I was like, yes, okay, perfect. Um, I came back and I tried to apply for a few positions. Unfortunately, it was very difficult uh, to find a job here for, uh, in, in general, in football, for a girl. Uh, especially in positions where you're working in men's football, it's even more difficult. Uh, and I'm sorry, my dog is going crazy at the same time. Um, so I, I think it was much more difficult for me to find a job. So I started asking for volunteering and unexpectedly I had a chance to volunteer at FK Sarajevo, uh, doing their sports legal, uh, work. And after a few months, I think it was two months, uh, I received the position of head of legal at the club. We restructured the complete legal department because technically there wasn't really a legal department in, in per se. Uh, and after six months in total after that, uh, I got a position as the CEO and I'm the first woman CEO of FK Sarajevo which was a shock because, as you know, uh, Ed, I really don't have too much Instagram friends or followers or in general that I'm too much in the media because uh, we have such a big fan base. We have a lot of people uh, here that are crazy about football and it was just the safest uh, situation for me is to delete the account so I don't have to deal with comments. And to be honest, I decided to stop reading any comments because of course everybody's going to have their opinion whatever you do whether you're doing it well or not uh, it always depends whether that person uh thinks it's a good idea or not so it, it's hard to please everybody so it's better just not to read the comments <laughs> so that's kind of my uh transition that was four years ago and i've been the ceo for four years actually uh first of uh first of october was four years <laughs> And I'm sorry, my dog is <laughs> having a day. <laughs> hey, is, this is modern way of doing online events. Just really quickly going back, um, I think the audience and I find this really interesting. When you set it up your first team, um, may I ask what sort of challenges you went through and the courage to just stick at it? Like when you got the rejection of the three kids who left because of the parents, what made you just carry on? Because it's stories like this that move the game forward, if that makes sense. Of course. Uh well, you know, I have always believed in taking a more difficult road. That's why I kind of wanted the challenge itself. <laughs> I think uh, the kind of, uh, it sums up my whole life. I always wanted to do something differently. I will explain. Every person in my high school took Spanish class to learn Spanish because there's so many people from South America, from Mexico there, and there's somebody that they can practice with. Uh, I decided to take French because I wanted to be completely different than anybody else. And I wanted to take something more difficult because it would take me a much longer time, sorry, much longer time for me to uh, 
for me to to you know learn and there's not many people that I can tra translate to so in general when I did the women's team per se uh, it was difficult let's say for me from the beginning and I thought to pull away but so many people told me you know you're not gonna get enough uh, girls on the team you're not gonna be able to succeed you're not gonna be able to you know get the team together nobody's gonna allow you for to for you to do this uh, so there's so many comments and I just wanted to prove them wrong. I wanted to do something that was much more difficult, and I want to show them that's possible. So every single time I hit, let's say, the wall, and I said, okay, come on, you can do this, keep pushing. You don't want to, you know, back away, and somebody will say, see, I was right. You know, you were not able to. Of course, it's not always the situation. You'll have situations where you have to step down. But I knew that if I was persistent in the situation, that will find a way and still the women's team is still active uh until this day so it, for me it was a very happy moment definitely so would you say it's good to have that sort of underdog mentality if that makes sense i'm looking at the mindset now of how you function and, and i find this really fascinating so just for the audience listening when you are facing adversity it's it's good to be an underdog is that what you're trying to say well yes in, in some sense <laughs> yes i guess um i am somebody that doesn't follow let's say the trend uh i like to do some things my own way if i believe it's the right way and you can see she's joining me in the conversation <laughs> uh if i think it's the right way then i will definitely uh work towards that way because i want to uh i want to follow in the steps that i believe and i think uh being even the underdog it is very nice to see that you can prove people wrong and it's not just about that it was proving that I believed in what I wanted to achieve from the beginning. So I never gave up on my dream and my goal, uh, if that makes sense. So I think it was most important to me to know that I didn't give up and then everything else. So I think it, it was my, let's say, uh, my wish to make sure that I achieved this. And just get into when you're 27, because I'm 27 this year, when you got the CEO position, I'm still getting my head around. What was going through <laughs> your mind when you got that position? I'm just really intrigued. Oh. I don't know, some people, maybe, I don't know, in that situation, situation people would be celebrating, going out, I don't know, uh, celebrating with their friends, excited about it. Uh, I had the situation where my parents were visiting from the States because, as I mentioned, they stayed in the States when I was 19. So uh, they came to visit me, and to be honest, I called them and I said, I think this... Uh, you know, one of the members of the board told me that I'm going to be a CEO. And my mom's like, come on, you know, come to, to the house. We'll talk about it. I was like, going, and I was like, I don't know if I heard him right, because I didn't even believe it. And uh, keep in mind, even though I, if I, even though that I was working as the head of legal, I was still playing football actively. So I knew right away if this position came into place, it's the first time. And if I let it go, it's a question whether I will be able to have it again in the future. Uh, second of all, I have to uh, keep in mind that I'm going to have to stop playing football. There's not going to be any time for me to play. So at the, tw at the age of 27, I retired. And I was really shocked. Uh, right away, uh, I received uh, advice from our PR at the moment. Uh, he told me, for the time being, it's best for you because people might react differently than what you're used to in the States. Uh, it may be best for you to completely cut yourself out from the media just for the time being for the situation to relax and to be honest a lot of the fans wrote even to uh Tansri, which was the investor at the moment uh they wrote to him against me that i don't know him but he would copy the messages and send to me but he would send the reply as well and i think that was very important at that moment completely important to me at that moment because when he sent the reply, he said, okay, Sabrina is young, she is 27, but I believe in giving her an opportunity because I believe that trust is the first thing that must be uh, the main and core thing as to why I chose her and I trust her. With time, she will get the experience. And I think his support and that message meant more to me. Although I was like a ghost the first, let's say 10, 14 days, because I came into a club where we have 95 employees and I was like, okay, so, what do I do? <laughs> I'm used to being on a different position. Of course, I, I, I had the women's team, but we had maybe in total three, four employees because we were still just starting and it's a women's team. So I was like, okay, uh, where do I start? So of course I started from the financial department and worked my way up. 
but it really took some key people, especially I have to say uh, to Tansri and now even with our new investors, it just made, made me believe in my, uh, let's say, my positioning, my goals, and that if I was going to be in this uh, position as the CEO, as the first woman CEO, um, even though I stopped playing football, I got a position to be in football, in a football club. So I think that was the most important factor and the support that I received from the beginning. Otherwise, it's really difficult. Uh, and I've heard uh, once too many times that it's lonely at the top. Uh, it's mentioned already in one of the interviews that I was at. Uh, it's very lonely at the top. And if you have at least one or two key people around you supporting you, whether it's family, whether it's from work, it's quite important to make sure when you're feeling that maybe you're on an unstable, let's say road or a rock, uh, that somebody tells you, come on, just believe in what you think you can achieve and believe in your uh, wish, what you want to achieve with the club and you will get there. So for me, it really, really, really meant a lot. So I have to mention that. And I mentioned, I think a million times and everybody knows that around me that I mentioned Tansri and uh, PVF and Mr. Nam that are the now investors at the club. I mention them all the time because without their mindset and wanting to change the view of the club and pointing, appointing a woman at the age of 27 as a CEO, you really have to trust the person and you have to trust your gut as well to go that direction because it's never been achieved here at FK Sarai before. Just with regards to trusting your gut, I want to talk and I want to talk about putting a plan in place is something we had with our first of a conversation. And you said, if I'm going to be in this position, let's go big, let's win the double. So I want, I would love you to go deep now in what inspired you to go big by winning the double in three years. So the main theme of this session, everybody is what are the benefits of putting a three year plan at a football club to win titles? So Sabrina, what was the inspiration behind this plan? Well, first of all, I have to let everyone know whoever wants to be in football, that football is, completely unpredictable so even if you make a plan be prepared to adjust it because football can change i mean we would say covid and then we would change the complete structure of the competitions for our wefa at this point so i think we have to be a little bit flexible uh in especially in this position because everything changes if your results go up you're on a good place and nobody will comment about your administration and what you're doing in general Every, when it goes down, you can be the best CEO in the world, but they will comment you. Even though if maybe I'm not the one that put the left back that played last night or the striker that didn't score a goal, it didn't matter. You're the first one that's guilty. So um, in, in general, when I came there, I wanted to kind of put my thoughts on paper. Uh, I watched a lot of matches of FK Sarajevo even before I became the CEO, and we had the best team the best team in the league. But there was a problem because the year before I came in, we were fourth and we didn't go to UEFA competition. But the year before that, we won the title. So I went backwards and looked at what happened and why it happened. And what happened is that in 2015, we won the title. Of course, there was a lot of interest towards our players. The players were sold. And I mean, that's the situation, but you have to balance. And so what I did is I looked everything back and then I said, okay, what do I want to achieve? I want to achieve something that nobody has achieved. Not because I'm a woman CEO, because I was getting sick of the title. I mean, somebody might like it, but I was getting sick of the title where people were saying, oh, you're the first ever woman CEO. I didn't want that to be my name tag, let's say. I wanted to be something that not the woman or the man achieved ever. So I wanted to do something completely differently. So I was, uh, I was, let's say, I believed in the team, even the first year, that we would try to win the double title. But I think the club, in regards to the people that were involved in the club, you could see that some of them were not maybe in support of me. And it was bouncy. Uh, it was uh, trembling uh, at that point. So you could see that wasn't maybe even the right timing to win the double title. But we lost on the cup finals. And... Uh, title, we I think we were three or four points behind the first place. And unfortunately, we, we didn't win the double title the first year, but we started building blocks. 
I said, okay, I want more academy players. We currently have three academy players. How do I get to having five, 10? How do I get to better uh, player sales? So we kept building slowly each year. And I said, okay, I can't win the double title the first year. And it's good we didn't win it. But what can I do to get to that? Because it's something that it's very big in this country. When you win the double title, you're you're the leader. It, there's no uh, nothing above that. <laughs> um, so at, at that point, I decided to make the three-year plan. I decided to go through the three-year plan and make it realistic. I didn't go, let's say, overnight. We're gonna earn 50 million, you know, euros. We're gonna bring Ronaldo and Messi to play in FK. I mean, that's unrealistic. So what I did is I made a plan that was realistic to the previous results and realistic to achieve within a three-year to four-year plan. And to be honest, at some point, I even forget to look at it. Uh, but I try to make sure at the end of the year that I kind of go through it just to see where I'm at. After three years, I noticed that almost every single point that we set out, uh, except commercially wise, and I have to mention that, and that's because we did a lot of transitioning in our departments. Uh, almost every single department we met, uh, we set, we met. And after three years, uh, last not last season but the season before that we won the double title so after actually two years of being there two seasons so i think you know at that point it, it's very important to have a business plan to set your goals to be able to measure them as well because it's much more difficult to go at something blindly it's much easier to set goals and then eventually or a three-year business plan and eventually to transition this um so if you're not able to win the double title then okay it's no problem but let's see what we can do to change and to elevate this in the future so thankfully you know it, it gives you guidelines can i just uh because we've got some clubs what? probably watching may i ask like one example of a measurable goal from a club perspective in, when you make these goals for the club can you just give one example i know you've given one with academy players but just other ones so other clubs could sort of learn from it if that makes sense well, uh, uh, other than, let's say, sporting, we always wanted to be in top three of the league because we believed we should be dominant. Um, and we were. We were always in top three. We wanted to always make it at least to second round UEFA competition. We didn't want to go too high, uh, but we wanted to show that every single year we raised it. Uh, we wanted to change the structure of the contracts of players because uh, as being someone with a sports law background, I noticed that none of the contracts actually had any uh, incentives. There was no bonuses uh, to mot motivate the players. So they had a strict salary, let's say, of 10,000 euros, and that's what they received. But it wasn't fair because some of the players that were actually bench were earning more than the ones that were on the field. So we restructured that. We added categories to the salaries themselves. But this is something that we said that we can measure. We could say, okay, this year we didn't, you know, change all the contracts of the players. We changed 50%. Next year we'll change 100%. And we made this so we can show the transition and we followed the contracts that were there. Let's say if one player had a three-year contract, okay, we knew that we probably can't change this contract until the last year where we're negotiating for the contract. So we made it something that is easy to get. Uh, financially wise, we try to generate as much profit as possible, although uh, it's much difficult coming from Bosnia without a EU passport. Uh, players are much more difficult to be sold, but we made it possible. Uh, I'm happy to say that in, in, in the four years that I've been here, we've had very successful transfer windows. The first two years, um, we sold around six Sabrina, oh, oh, <clears throat> hold on. Just a few tech issues. We'll get her back. Da, da, da. You're back. You're back. The signal just went. Carry on. It's all good. Carry on. Uh, 
my apologies here. It's really raining and terrible weather. So I think in general, it's a little bit unstable. Uh, but in general, I, just going back, uh, I think the three-year strategy, or in general, if you make a one-year strategy, if you want to stick it to one year, um, it's an easy way to be able to uh, follow which direction you wish to and what you wish to achieve. So for me, it was very important coming from uh, somebody that played football, that's been in the sports legal uh, department as well. It was very important to understand what I wanted to achieve. And it wasn't just the results. I wanted to make sure that our academy players had the opportunity to come to the first, uh, first team, which was really not easy coming from a club that is used to always dominating, being first, and people are very, very scared to transition and to add academy players into the first team. But as I mentioned earlier, it's quite important to make sure that the investor supports your ideas and your strategy and your plan. Amazing. I hope the audience are enjoying this. The one thing I want to touch on now, going in depth with how your skill sets have developed being a CEO, but I'm really intrigued about your leadership skills. May I ask, like, have your leadership skills developed throughout time out of interest? Uh, yes, <laughs> definitely. I think the first year I didn't, uh, it took me a while to trust everybody. Um, and I've, I've had too many situations where I've been in Bosnia where people were, it's not just about in Bosnia, but you know, you can't rely on somebody finishing some tasks. So I did not learn how to delegate easily. Um, I was a captain uh, of a women's team. I was a captain for a very long period of time. So doing delegations and in general being a leader is something that I've been since I was very young. But I think it was a different kind of situation where you're responsible for 90, 95 people. And if the salary is late for 10 days, the first person they're going to come to is to me. So it, it took me a while. I didn't really sleep that much. And I think the first thing you have to learn is to delegate because to be honest, there's a reason why you have a marketing department. There's a reason why you have a head of marketing. <laughs> there's a reason why you had a head of financing. And if I'm going to be doing everything that I don't know why I need these departments, and I don't think it's my expertise as well. I don't think I would be good in financing. Uh, but I think it was it was very important for me to first of all uh, gain trust, their trust towards me, and my trust towards them. Especially some of them I couldn't. We just decided to change. And even I was trying to give them an opportunity to work with them. But after a while, you can see that it, they didn't believe the direction I was going. And that's quite important. So I, I think it definitely I've learned so much in, in, in the last three, four years. I've been a leader on the field, but this is a completely different situation. You have a lot more people that rely on you. And everything that is wrong, you will be the first one to notice it. And people will be the first to come to you. And sometimes when it's the best, all the results, usually all the praises go towards the players and the coaches, which for me is perfectly fine because I try to stay behind the media and the limelight. As you know, I'm not too much in the media. Uh, so for me, that is okay. It just took me a while to realize that I have a team. I have to make a team if I don't have the persons uh, right now in the right positions. So I changed the complete structure of the administration. I reorganized the complete administration. I split apart the marketing and the communications. Um, I brought in a sports coordinator to, to be my right hand for the sporting side because I can't really be at the training center all the time. Uh, but at the same time, uh, my investors did not believe in having a sports director or technical director, which is okay. It's reasonable. It all goes through me technically. and. I saw the problems that we had was communication and teamwork. Uh, previous people that were in the club or previous management uh, had their different way of leadership. And I have mine different way. Mine is using the team and utilizing every single strength of the team. It just took me a while to involve them and to notice who could fit into my puzzle. Uh, but the previous CEO made all the decisions for everybody. So it was quite difficult for them to stand out. And some of them could not transition into my kind of work. So leadership is not one, let's say, uh, one fits all. Leadership, it all depends on the personality, on the person and how they see and view their way that they should lead the team. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I find this fascinating. I hope the audience are as well, because... Um, lean up to my next point, like with the communication side, that's why having a plan is so important. I'm sort of looking backwards. You have the plan, then you get the communication so everybody's on board. 
just for you being a CEO, because you get the high pressures, as you said earlier, to be in this business, it's, it's so fast paced. Like, look at the season now with regards to COVID. May I ask, why is it important in your position to switch off? Like, there's time to work and there's time to chill, because if not, you could just be on your phone working all the time. And I just want to have this sort of balance that, you know, you are a human being and having that down to downtime is just as important as well. Well, this is why I have a dog, because it's me. <laughs> but I'm stealing all my socks. I really have to say this. <laughs> Actually, I have four dogs, so I have a lot of dogs. Um, well, one of the things I have to mention is that I didn't know how to shut off my phone. Uh, the first two years, uh, I think a lot of people can relate, especially when you're uh the first in the situation or for especially especially for women in general if you're in this situation like i am people look to you uh for every single mistake and i'm talking about a small mistake a small needle in a haystack when if it was the other side and i've been there i've had a ceo before that i was you know a part of it was if it was the other side people don't notice as much so people were waiting for me to fall not because of me but because i was a woman and they didn't think in any way that i would be you know ready to take on the club be there especially this big club which is the biggest in in our country um I think people were waiting for some type of mistake of mine. And that's why everybody was even going through some of my old pictures when I was 17, 18 years old and using them to publish them because they find, found them. And I was like, okay, 18 years old. And I had, let's say, a you know, shirt up to here showing my belly button. They're like, this is our CEO. I was like, okay, seriously, 18 years ago, I had a really nice stomach and figure, of course I'm going to show my stomach. <laughs> so, you know, it, the first two years, I was constantly on the phone because I had to show that I can do this job. So um, I remember when, when I came back from a meeting with the investor, they said, okay, next three months, we want you to sell players. We're not sending any cash. And I was the only one there spending from eight till 12 o'clock at night, every single day. We were able to generate close to a million euros and we were able to fin finance us much more than we thought. Uh, I was very lucky, but I worked two months. I received the I received pneumonia of my lungs because I didn't stop. I didn't stop. I was sick. I was coughing all the time, but I didn't stop. And after the last day of the transfer window, when I finished everything, the next day, I noticed that I wasn't feeling well. And I went to the doctors, and he, you know, looked at me and looked, took some tests, and he said, "Okay, we have to put you in IV fluids." And I thought it was just a cough. After 10 days, uh, after all the tests that I did, I had pneumonia. And I had pneumonia twice in one year. And that was because I was completely uh, focused on work. I was at 3 o'clock at night, I would wake up to communicate with our investors. I wanted to make sure there was no uh, space for me to make mistakes. Of course, I made them. But I don't think they were as big as they would have been if I wasn't working that long. And after a while, I noticed, okay, I need the team. I need a team of people. So this is why, as I mentioned earlier, there I needed to change some of the positions in the club, the way the club worked. And now I have the luxury to, for example, this past weekend, we didn't have any matches. I have the luxury to go hiking with my dogs. I have the luxury to turn off my phone. Um, usually, I, I actually never turn off my phone, but I usually l let my uh, assistant no, if I am going, you know, to relax or something and I tell her, okay, only for you, I'm going to answer. That means it's an emergency. So even when I go to vacation, my phone is on, I'm working because I have to sign off a lot of documents, but I always try to make sure that one person is responsible when I'm not there and everybody goes to her. Unfortunately, she hates when I go to vacation. <laughs> I think now it's much easier and it's quite important to kind of wind off. Otherwise, I think you're going to go crazy. Um, I'm very lucky that I really love my job and I really love football that I didn't see it too much as a job. And so I was working overtime without noticing, noticing what it did to my body. But after two years, I was lucky to be able to have my own house, to have my dogs, to be able to spend the weekend, to go hiking, to go spend time, you know, outdoors. And for me, that's quite important to kind of do that over the weekend so I can re regain my batteries for the rest of the week. Because as you know, football is quite hectic. <laughs> 
What did I say, everybody? This conversation, I knew it was going to be juicy. I knew it was going to be interesting. I want to finish one question, and it's going to relate to the last interview we had. You said a statement, when I won the double, that was the time when I wasn't called the women's CEO, I was the CEO. And I think you remember my reaction uh, that, you know, it shouldn't matter, that, you know, football is football. But one of our goals for this summit is to really raise the awareness of inequality. So may I ask what you want to see in women's football moving forward with regards to this inequality perspective? I think, uh, you know, I've had so many difficulties and I think I'm still facing them till this day. I mean, we discussed even earlier. I, I think that it shouldn't matter. Uh, and I, I grew up in the States where I learned differently. It shouldn't matter whether I'm a girl or whether I'm a guy, whether I have a different color, whether I'm different religion. I believe it at least that way. I have a different view of how I see things and I try to always push towards the way that I see it. But these things shouldn't matter. It's how I do my job. That's why I was completely different than my previous CEO. I'm not in the media whatsoever. I try to ignore the media. Media, um, sometimes I feel that they would pay a lot of money for me to just do an interview. And it's just because they know that somebody else cannot receive it. For me, I tried to stay behind the spotlight. And one time an uh, interview asked me, said, okay, your previous people would always go around and say, I'm the CEO, I'm the CEO, I did this, I did that. And then when it's bad, he's in somewhere or she, doesn't matter, in a hole. For me, I said, my work should be, you know, what speaks for me. I don't need to speak at the, that point of time. The most interesting people are the ones that are on the pitch. We generate football, we generate matches. So the most interesting thing is a football match. And of course, it's not always going to be positive. It's going to be bad. It's going to be good. You're going to have good matches. We started this season playing terribly. But right now, currently, uh, after 10 matches, we have not lost one match. So even though we played terribly, we were playing good as a team. And I'm not in the media, uh, too much in local media, let's say, because I don't think I need to be. Um, and I tried to st stay behind the limelight. Uh, but as you mentioned, for me, it's quite important for people to realize uh, to realize that it's not whether I'm a woman, whether I'm, you know, a different race. It's important what I was able to achieve and what I'm willing to achieve and what my perspective is. I always say my first and foremost, uh, most important factor of what I'm doing is to put the club at first. Uh, I never put my uh, initial interest or somebody else's interest first. It's always the club. And sometimes I, I don't always, people don't always agree with me. And sometimes I step on toes. That's because I'm always focusing on trying to make sure that the club is the first interest. And um, I think that's why we were able to receive the double title. Then we won the back-to-back -back title which was the first time in history thankfully uh, that and we just re uh, played playoffs after such a long period of time not playing playoffs in the UEFA competition so I think all of this should be a, some type of results not mine but collectively for the club and not because some woman is running the club but because we have such a good team and it's quite important to be able to uh, it's quite important to be able to believe in what you wish to achieve and not allow too much outside <laughs> to 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 cause you to change your mind unless there's something that you need to be changed or unless you negotiate differently i i hope i, I tried to explain yeah, you that. you did and look you know I'm a, you know i'm a big fan of you sabrina literally it's always a pleasure chatting with you and every time we speak i learn something new look really quickly you know i'm a big fan of helping students i want one skill that has supported you in the football industry <laughs> one skill. <laughs> yeah, that's too tough. difficult. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm niching it down to one. one. Yeah. Three, and then we can check, kind of move it in. Uh, one skill. Uh, networking. One skill. I'm very open, and I like to communicate with different people. And in the football industry, especially in the football industry, you have to have good friends, good connections. You have to know Ed. I mean, look at how many times we've talked the last <laughs> last year. And this is networking. This is part. Right now, what we're doing is networking. People are, are coming to this program, uh, being able to tell their stories. As I mentioned to you earlier, I, I listened to Ebru once. And I told myself after two years, you know, after being a CEO, I, I even when I saw her, I looked at her and I said, Ebru, where were you two years ago for me? So I think 
networking and having this ability to be able to connect, to be able to introduce yourself, for somebody to hear your story, to hear your struggle, because maybe that one person that can support you, when I mentioned in the beginning when Tan Sri supported me, maybe that one person went through all of that. Maybe it's not me, but maybe someone can help assist me. So I think the networking and being able to generate such a, a, a wonderful uh, network of your own, and if not for work, at least friends, and you can always rely on this. And maybe somebody knows somebody else that can help you when you need it. So I think at this point, uh, networking is a very big skill for me and football in general. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more with networking. As you know, it's all about the circles. It's also about the like the conversations you create. But look, on that note, I'm going to wrap it up. It's been such a pleasure, as, you, as always, Sabrina, to chat with you. I hope you've enjoyed it, the live audience. But this is day one. We've still got another four days left ahead. And uh, bring it on. And look, please support the show on Twitter. Please support the show on Facebook. And Sabrina, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you to all.